Hello, all. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's first virtual public program. My name is Kayla Hopper. I'm Director of Outreach at AAS. And for those of you who have joined us for public programs in person in the past, uh, we want to thank you for making the switch over to a virtual format. This is really exciting for us, and we're glad you could join us. And for those that are new to our public programs, welcome. We're so happy to be able to expand our audience this way, and we couldn't have asked for a better program to start out this new venture with. We're very uh, excited about all of it. Uh, as we do likely have some people here who are new to us, let me quickly introduce the American Antiquarian Society. We're a national research library of American history and culture whose mission is to collect, preserve, and share the printed record of what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the British West Indies before the 20th century. In doing so, we collect anything and everything printed within these parameters, from graphic prints and ephemera, to newspapers and periodicals, to pamphlets and books. We use these collections as the basis for all of our programs, such as this one. Before we get into introductions for today's speakers, I do want to point out a couple of features of Zoom webinar that's a little different from the Zoom meetings um, that many of us are now familiar with. We are using Zoom webinar today. Um, so I just want to point out to you that there is a chat function. You're welcome to use this, uh, particularly for discussion um, and just kind of any thoughts you have, you can post in there. Um, I'll also be posting some relevant links into that box. For example, um, I'll put in a link to information about Allison's book, to a link to Allison and Mary's podcast. And also, if you're looking for some fun new background images for your next Zoom meeting, we've created a couple of those. Um, and I'll post a link to the Zoom meeting as well. Um, so all of that will be in the chat. As for the Q&A, uh, there is a separate Q&A function that you will see. This is where we ask that you, uh, you put your Q&A for the speakers. When the main conversation is done, they will be taking uh, questions. So make, just make sure that they go into the Q&A, not the chat, so it'll help us keep track of them. There's also an upvote function in the Q&A. So if you see someone post a question that you like and you really wanna see asked, um, just upvote it and we can kind of get that to the top of the queue. Uh, my colleague, Nan Wolverton, is also helping me out today. She's kind of silently behind the scenes helping out, but she'll be able to jump in, help answer questions, uh, answer anything in chat. So just if you see her name pop up, uh, that's, that's who she is. Now for today's program. Let's uh, turn to that. You don't need to dig far into our collections to realize that visuals are very powerful. From woodblock engravings in 18th century newspapers to large late 19th century chromolithographed prints to relatively unassuming trade cards and carte de visites, visual imagery draws the eye and tells a story. And that story is often a political one. From Revere's bloody massacre print to political cartoons of Andrew Jackson to photographs of suffragists, images have been key to political movements throughout the history of the United States. Contemporary media continues to teach us the same lesson all the more acutely in recent days. Today's program will delve into how both supporters and opponents of the women's suffrage movement harnessed that same power. So let me now introduce you to today's presenters. So I'm gonna ask Allison and Allison and Mary to turn on their video. Hi guys, good to see you. So first I'd like to introduce Allison Lang whose new book, Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement, was just published by the University of Ch Chicago Press and is the center of today's discussion. Allison is Associate Professor of History at the Wentworth Institute of Technology and is an active public historian. Her writing has appeared in Imprint, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post, and she has worked with the National Women's History Museum and curated exhibitions for the Boston Public Library's Leventhal Map Center. For the 2020 centennial of the 19th Amendment, she's curating exhibitions at the Massachusetts Historical Society and Harvard's Schlesinger Library. She's also a former AAS fellow, and she's done wonderful work for us in the past, so we're very happy to have her back again today. Leading the conversation with Allison are Allison Horrocks and Mary Mahoney, co-hosts of the Fantastic American Girls podcast, in which they explore the wild world of American girl fandom. In each episode, Allison and Mary dive into the, uh, sorry, Allison and Mary dive into an American Girl book from their and my childhood, using their knowledge as professional historians and finely tuned instincts as amateur pop culture critics to take you back to a very different time, the 1990s. If you remember the pleasant company years of the American Doll books, 
uh, Amer American Girl Dolls and the books, I highly suggest that you check out their podcast. You will not be disappointed. It's, it's a lot of fun. Allison is also a park ranger at Lowell National Park in, uh, sorry, Lowell National Historical Park in Lowell, Mass. And Mary is currently based at Trinity College, where she is the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Digital Humanities. The titles are tripping me up, guys. Um, and so uh, with those introductions, I'm going to turn it over to the three of you. Excellent. So to start us off, I'm going to give you like a quick three minute spiel about my book so that we all are kind of on the same page to start the conversation. So my book is Picturing Political Power. I have a copy of it and I'm going to show it off because it's a really beautiful book and I'm very proud of the work that um, the press did with it. Um, I do also want to start off by saying thank you so much to Kayla and the rest of the AAS staff and of course Allison and Mary. I'm so excited about this program and thank you for all of the work that you've put into it. So my book is thinking about the ways that images were a significant part of women's rights activism in the 19th and early 20th century. I actually, maybe to some surprise, actually start in the late 18th century. And the reason I do that is because when we think about the kinds of visual conventions that we even still have today, we are thinking about things that have actually, we have a legacy of these things that were very popular in the late 18th century, like thinking about, you know, presidents as these elite white men, you know, the leading figures that we have today. Even now, when you think of the term president, you probably do think of a man in that role. At the same time in the late 18th century, there are very few portraits of women that are reaching the public. There are certainly painted portraits hanging on walls of women, um, and the cartoons that are circulating of women who do decide to perhaps protest or boycott tea during the British Revolution, for example, um, the American Revolution, for example, we have, you know, caricatures, we have cartoons mocking them. They mock them as women who are going to abandon their children if they participate in politics. Um, they emphasize that they are going to be um, masculine, you know, not feminine, kind of ugly women. Um, and they really are focused on, you know, showing that if these women win, win political rights, win a political voice, that they will um, force men to actually become more feminine, to have to take on domestic tasks, to have to take care of children, um, if you can even believe it. So this is what, this is the visual iconography of anti-suffrage imagery really starting in the 18th century and you know going well into the end of the suffrage movement on the other hand, we've got um, suffragists who are far more innovative um, and they are, you know, thinking from the, the earliest portraits of suffragists that circulate, um, particularly by activists like Sojourner Truth um, and um, later by Susan B. Anthony, who really works to make sure that portraits of suffrage leaders reach the public. You know, she's one of the reasons why we have the number of portraits we have of suffrage leaders in our archives and museums and libraries today. On the other hand, one of the things that my work really emphasizes is that that popular iconography is just one part of the story, right? So she promoted a particular version of white political womanhood um, and um, other women of color really weren't part of that vision for her. And so by the turn of the century, by the early 1900s, we actually have suffragists deciding to create national press committees, hire publicity professionals, have their own publishing company, and create the kinds of popular imagery that you might have encountered, perhaps in a museum or documentary. Um, these posters that are very colorful, emphasizing often that women, if they win the right to vote, will become better mothers, will take care of their family better. They will, you know, offer their moral virtue, ex virtuous expertise into the public sphere. And on the other hand, of course, we have the National Women's Party, particularly in the 1910s, later in the 1910s, doing things like parading and protesting in the streets. Um, and so we have this contrasting um, vision. And of course, 
another third contrasting vision of women of color, like Mary Church Terrell, who are emphasizing um, and, and placing themselves um, as political leaders, even though these white suffrage organizations are not. And so when we think about the ways that, you know, women even today still have to balance these representations of themselves as caregivers or, or mothers in particular, um, this is kind of a legacy of the suffrage movement, as is the, the images that oppose women's rights activism, you know, emphasizing that women in politics, women in political leadership positions are, are masculine, et cetera. So that's, the, that's kind of where I want to end and um, turn it over for some questions. So thank you so much for having us here today. Um, we're really grateful to Kayla and the team at AAS for inviting us. Allison, your book is so relevant and it took on this whole other set of meanings this week. One of the insights that you talk about is that suffrage, women in the suffrage movement in the US were the first to picket outside the White House and to demonstrate. And obviously this takes on new meaning after this week and what's entered our visual culture. So can you talk about that tactic in relation to what's just happened, what's changed, and what are some of the challenges that actually still persist? Sure. So when we think about the 1910s, I want to kind of get us there before we get to the present. When we're thinking about the 1910s, as you said, these suffragists were the first to stage a picket of the White House. You know, it was only within the last decade or so that, that women were kind of taking political space and having even public um, protests, rallies, and campaigns um, than, you know, uh, than they ever, you know, they hadn't really done that kind of activity before. And so when we're thinking about that um, in comparison um, to today, one of the things that was happening in the 1910s is that, you know, this was a protest, the picketing was a protest led by the National Women's Party, headed by Alice Paul with a lot of white women in leadership positions. Um, of the National Association of Colored Women, which is a, a pro-suffrage group made up of African American women, they did not want their members, they did not encourage their members to participate. And part of that was because of the danger of violence that they knew was a possibility. And they knew that, and these white women who did, who, you know, picketed knew of that violence and experienced that violence. They were arrested, they were put into jail, they were put into workhouses where they worked and eventually went on hunger strikes. Let no one tell you that this movement, you know, was, you know, these suffragists were not, you know, treated nicely and and perfectly the entire way through. They, they were definitely um, threatened by violence throughout. Um, but people feared that people of color, women of color in particular, would be even more vulnerable to this violence. And so I think that um, that is one, one component of this that still relates today. But I think it's important to remember that um, all of the picketers at that time um, this was a new thing and having women picketing the White House in January 2017 at a moment when the United States is entering World War I, people were really unhappy with it. Um, I'm going to show you a, a, an image of that um, because I think it's really valuable to get a sense of what that looks like. Um, this is kind of a popular image. This is the picture, you know, one of the pictures that's on my book. Um, and we may think about these as like a very victorious image today, but this is a very precarious image. Um, and another kind of aspect that I would connect to today's, you know, protest, today's conversations is that um, these women who are doing these public protests, you know, this isn't the only thing they're doing, right? This is, um, suffragists, other suffragists are condemning them for picketing the White House. You know, people do not agree, even then, that this is the right thing to do. And I think we still see that kind of fracture, even in conversations about today's protests. I'm kind of wondering as a follow-up, just to, you've really spoken so eloquently about kind of the racial piece of this, but I'm also wondering if we can bring class into the conversation and thinking about the ways, for example, that the National Women's Party, as you um, so eloquently say, really drew on working class protest strategies, including parades, but also is picketing something that they drew on as well. Yes, so 
you're right to mention this. And a lot of these suffrage tactics, um, kind of in the early 20th century, they're thinking, they're drawing from um, workers' protests, as you say, parades and kind of um, pickets and that sort of thing. And they are also drawing from British suffrage protests. That's, those are the two other places that are giving a lot of suffragists inspiration for what to do next. Hmm. So to kind of keep us on this topic of things that are resonant to things happening now, um, we wanted to quote actor and some might say public humanist Will Smith, who once observed racism is not getting worse, it's getting filmed. So we're wondering when you hear this statement, what echoes resonate for you vis-a-vis -vis the fights for justice and representation in the 19th century? I think this is a really interesting quote. And, you know, as a historian who studies visual technology, I want to like qualify it for him, right? Because <laughs> as we know, um, film has depicted racist representations since its origins. I mean, we can look at Birth of a Nation, um, which was screened by Woodrow Wilson at the White House, um, in its racist depictions of African American people and the, you know, the praise for the KKK in that film. And we can say that, well, this content has always been there. But I think the difference between then and now is actually the access that all of us have or that mo many of us have to a video, a, to a camera on our phone. And so I think one of the differences now is that, you know, anyone, if they see something happening, can actually take a, take a video, mm -hmm. upload that video and make it very publicly accessible in a way that would not have been at possible at all a century ago. And so I think that is really the distribution, the circulation of this film is actually what has changed. So not to take us in a completely different direction, but I do just want to draw people's attention to my background. It sort of looks like I'm a local TV newscaster um, filing a story from a party um, that I'm not high class enough to be invited to, but I am with Martha Washington right now in my virtual background. And I was really surprised reading your book at how much um, iconography around Martha Washington really resonates in this history of suffrage that I was completely unaware about. And we're talking about people both in favor of suffrage and its opponents, both kind of seizing on different um, images of Martha, or at least imagined images of Martha too. Um, I'm wondering if you can maybe share some of that with us because it's really fascinating. I would be delighted to. I um, also was surprised to find Martha Washington be such a significant part of the research. It was actually at my fellowship at American Antiquarian Society, where I first was working with these wonderful scholars, including Gigi Barnhill and Lauren Hughes, that helped me really access the, and find out, you know, I expected to find, you know, Dolly Madison as the, she's kind of Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison. They're the like popular ones today not in the 19th century as much. Um, so yeah, Martha Washington really became popular um, in the 19th century, even during her um, lifetime. So we have this fabulous um, Lady Washington's reception, kind of imagining this scene of what um, her events, her hostess scene of events for her husband, George Washington looked like. And this was her way, this was a way that elite white women could participate in politics by facilitating these conversations, by guiding these conversations among the political elite. And so this is kind of a very popular idealized image um, from 1865 of how Americans wanted women to participate in politics, even long after her life. Um, when we look at the look at 19th century portraits of Washington, this one is from a gift book, which was very popular, you know, they're ranging in price, so some are fairly inexpensive, some a little bit more so. You can see this is a really finely engraved portrait of Washington. Um, this may be unfamiliar to us now. Probably when you think of like a portrait of Martha Washington, you're thinking of like Gilbert Stewart's portrait of her with her like white cap on her face. Um, <laughs> but this was by far the most popular 19th century version. And it's of, it's a portrait of her from before she was married to George Washington. She's a fairly young woman here. Um, and, you know, she is you know, this is part of a biography, this is probably associated with a biography that really emphasizes that she 
doesn't want to participate in politics as a voter. She wants to participate in politics as a support for her husband. And so it becomes this, she becomes this icon of opposition, actually, to mm. suffrage activism. Um, but by the 1870s, 1876, especially around the centennial, we see a, um, a little bit of a shift. And the suffragists kind of, like, there's this one comment that I remember um, that, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's they comment that she looks like Martha Washington as though this is a compliment because <laughs> Martha Washington, I think was probably one of the most recognizable American women of the 19th century. Um, she, um, whenever she was, there was a portrait of George on a parlor wall. There was probably also a portrait of Martha. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, even though she's kind of dropped from that place, um, she's had that place in the 19th century. She was also the first and only woman to ever appear on U.S. currency, and I hope that changes someday soon. Um, but that just gives you a sense of how much of, a, of an icon, how much she meant to Americans in that time period. Definitely, yeah. So Martha's image really gets managed by other people after her death, but there are women in the 19th century who are spending quite a bit of time actively managing what we would think of as almost their media presence, right? Without the support of a team of professionals or people that you hire in LA, these are savvy people who copyright their image. They work very hard to manage it. We highly recommend the book, of course. As you're reading it, you keep hearing about um, these new efficient technologies, um, such as the carte de vie. And it's this kind of easy tactile way to carry around someone's likeness. What were people doing with these and who were they buying? Who were they consuming in this act? Yeah, so carte visites are these really tiny, like this size uh, portraits. And, and I think people forget how tiny they are until they see them in person. They're super tiny. I'm gonna show you one um, and it's gonna, you can blow it up as, long, as big as you want on a screen, but in person they're tiny. And they, um, let's see, all right. Let's see, this isn't the one I want. I want this one, perfect. So this is the portrait of Sojourner Truth. As I said, it's very tiny. Um, Carte visites were actually um, collected. So you could, um, these galleries would, um, perhaps if you lived far away from a major city, send you a list of the photographs that they had available that you could like write in and send in your money and receive the photographs back. Or if you lived in a city, you could actually go in and purchase them in a gallery. Um, and people would collect them. Um, Photograph albums were really popular in the 19th century, like Lodi's, Godey's Ladies Book, which was the most popular magazine in America by, prior to the Civil War, you know, emphasized that every American family should have a photograph album. And fortunately, these were very inexpensive items. The albums could be inexpensive. The carte visites were very inexpensive as well. So they were widely accessible. And people would collect them and, you know, in our world, we can kind of draw, uh, you know, do a quick Google search for any figure that we might want to like learn what they look like. Um, you know, if you want to know what the president looks like, you can do a quick Google search, easy. In the 19th century, if you want to know what the president looks like, buying a carte de visite is a great option. So actually, we have these albums from the 19th century where you've got like a portrait of Abraham Lincoln as well as a portrait of Jefferson Davis because people want to know what mm. these figures look like. They're curious. So they're very much um, items that people would collect and kind of create their, their imagination of the world around them. I'm kind of wondering as a question of circulation and almost a history of the book kind of question, if, if we can get a sense of what the history of the circulation of these items was like. And I mean, when I was reading your book and thinking about this, I was kind of imagining, is it possible that they circulated in the same way that maybe baseball cards do now or have in the past? Um, and is there any way to possibly recover that? And I guess as a follow-up to a follow-up, because I'm just that interested in it, I'm thinking about a book like Writing with Scissors and and great works like that, that imagine that curating a scrapbook is a way of in fact um, creating a new text and were they used in that way as well? Yes, so when people would put these albums together, um, people would think about the ways that um, 
people would exchange them with friends and you're right to think about them as a baseball card. That's actually an analogy I use all the time in class. Um, But yeah, thinking about them as baseball cards, you want to collect them all. You want one of your favorite actor, actress, writer, political leaders, whatever. Um, And you trade them with people. So your friend perhaps gets their card to visit portrait made um, and you get one with them. Um, You want to go to a lecture by Sojourner Truth um, and you want to purchase one um, at the lecture. And so when we're thinking about that, um, this is this is very much, as you said, like creating your your world around you. And um, I think that's a really powerful experience. And I, you know, I think that our version of that is perhaps, you know, an Instagram account, right? Like we're creating kind of our own public persona, but it's like that same type of kind of curation of your world around you. Or like maybe even just who you subscribe to in your feed kind of curates that world for you. So as we were reading your book and, you know, Mary and I spent many hours on the phone talking about it and right around the time we were reading your work, there was a controversy on Instagram actually over a post made by the singer and songwriter Lana Del Rey. And what she talked about was being a person that she considered um, sort of glamorous and delicate in a very particular way. And she made this statement that feminism needs needed to make space for people who looked like her which stunned a lot of people because historically she's exactly who has been at the center of conversations about feminism and feminist leaders and women's rights. So as you saw that debate kind of playing out in social media and this kind of outcry that, you know, a person who's actually been central, that kind of image to a movement now feels marginal. How did you hear and kind of process that? Well, I think it's really interesting to think about the ways that we continue to imagine feminists, um, we still have this legacy of these anti-suffrage cartoons, um, this stereotype of this, you know, overly serious, um, uh, uh, dedicated person to this cause who isn't interested in kind of more feminine, frilly things. Um, And I think that one example of that, you know, from historical images might be this one that I just want to pull into this. Um, And this one gives us a sense that women cannot win, whether you're feminist or not. In this particular case, these are women's voting rights activists. You know, it, it's make, this print is making fun of women who are wearing feminine fashions. You know, you've got these, um, you know, For those of us who aren't, you know, 19th century fashionistas, you've got these bows that are as big as this woman's face in the center right there. People were not wearing bows quite that large. And they they were wearing hair pieces, just, you know, hair extensions like people do today. They were also not quite as large as we see in this picture. And in the front, we have a woman wearing bloomers. And these bloomers are not at all the type of bloomers that women women's rights activists were wearing in the 1850s. And in fact, by 1869, they had abandoned them for about two decades. And so this is critiquing these women's wedding rights activists on both sides. You know, if you are, um, you know, wearing fashionable feminine attire, we cannot take you seriously. You're not a rational actor. Um, On the other hand, if you are wearing really rational, like more practical attire, like these bloomers, um, you are threatening. You're like too masculine. Um, You um, shouldn't, um, you're you're taking too much space in the center. You're being too serious. And so I think that, that commentary, this entire conversation, which, you know, in addition to her comments is like something that we um, see a lot when we're thinking about images of women, um, feminist, you know, feminist leaders or not, um, in our popular culture, you know, there's this constant balancing act between this interest in kind of the masculine um, representations of authority, like wearing, you know, a pantsuit in 2016, um, or and kind of more feminine um, representations and an emphasis, you know, even today, when you look through the the media feeds of like a female politician, you see, you know, them serving, you know, dinner to their family or something, you know, it's, it's, it's this constant challenge. Um, And so I think that that's really part of that conversation still. 
Yeah, and just picking up on that tightrope that you're talking around, around not appearing too masculine and, and maintaining some femininity. Um, actually, your book made me think a lot about um, Annie Oakley, because you mentioned that your study is focusing on um, photographs that are designed to be public. Um, and I was thinking a lot about photography of Annie Oakley, who identified as um, an anti-suffragist, and thinking about the ways that she used photography to frame herself in public, not unlike a lot of the suffragists that you cover. And I'm sort of wondering if you could maybe just put her into this conversation and maybe kind of speak on, you note know, in your book that anti-suffragists were less um, insistent on imagery, I guess, but or of their personal images. But was performance involved in this? Can we see that here? And how can we maybe put them in conversation together? Yeah, so Annie Oakley is a great example of someone who really cultivated her public image as this, you know, very, you know, fairly proper Victorian woman who also was an amazing shooter. <laughs> and so she really, interestingly, um, and this is a perfect tie in, had to balance both the kind of masculine, um, um, uh, you know, skill of shooting versus the more feminine attributes that she had. And so I think that when we're thinking about her and the anti-suffrage movement, which don't be surprised that she's an anti-suffragist, there are women who were very much, you know, pushing the anti-suffrage movement forward. Um, she is someone who you know, was trying to balance these two aspects of her life. And I do wonder if she really was an anti-suffragist or if this was a public stance that she um, was using, was taking on in order to downplay, to make her seem less threatening. And, I, and we, we may never know the answer to that one. Um, but I also think that I find that women with a certain level of additional power are far less likely to advocate for suffrage, right? So women who are often in far more wealthy circles, who might be well connected, perhaps they are having dinner at the governor's house and talking to their representatives just through their social contacts, that's more likely to be the kind of place where anti-suffragists were mm. strong. And, you know, I think that, you know, uh, connecting to like uh, the Mrs. America and, and Phyllis Schlafly in that series, right? You see her um, in this series, you know, participating in these high level political conversations and yet advocating against the ERA. And so I think that, you know, having, feeling like you have power, like Annie Oakley did have popular power, um, does probably also make one feel like the vote may not be as essential to making your voice heard. Yeah, definitely. So as you were talking about women who have you know, some access to power, who maybe are not necessarily joining mainstream suffrage movements, there's also working class women who are highly activated and are deeply involved in politics who are either alienated from the suffrage movement, are exclusive or discriminated against and not allowed to take part in various things. Um, but there's also a huge moment right around the time of suffrage of working class activism and people who are drawn to anarchism, who are drawn to other movements they see as more radical. Um, so kind of breaking apart institutions as opposed to getting access and I'm blocking all the women in my picture and I, I know it's ironic, so just go with it. Um, it. It is what it is. There's also clouds working against me, but um, you know, people like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn who are out in the forefront, a lot of their tactics are then copied by women in the suffrage movement. So to what degree in the early 20th century are women in mainstream um, and a lot of these sort of like segregated movements, are they innovators or are they just kind of copying or is there bleed over and a bit of both? It's, you know, always a bit of both, a bit of everything. I'm going to say it's really complicated, like all historians do, right? So there's definitely a bit of copying of the, pro the tactics of labor protesters, no question. Um, there's also innovation, right? Because the same types of tactics, the precisely same type of parade that a labor group wants to have down um, in, down in Washington, D.C. is not the same type of parade that a group of women, all women, only women can have, right? So when we think about the 1913 parade in Washington, D.C., 
if you um, have ever like Googled images of this, or if you tune into the New American Experience documentary that's coming out in the next month or two, um, has amazing like footage I've never before seen about this parade. It shows you how highly orchestrated they made their events um, and how much they cared about what people were wearing and how things were decorated and emphasizing you know different aspects of the movement so it's it's both borrowing and innovating um, the ways that they're using these tactics and i mean another example besides the labor movement and the british suffrage movement the other group that the suffragists are you know in some ways like fully copying is the women's christian temperance union um, which they, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is the largest women's organization in the late 19th century. They endorse suffrage. They're the ones who start with these national press committees and a publishing company of their own. It's the National American Women's Suffrage Association that copies that, right? There's just constant um, conversations among these activists. These circles are tight. So I'm wondering if bringing this conversation in some ways to the present, um, what are some of the lasting lessons of the suffrage movement in terms of the power of visual culture? So I think there's a few items. So it's the centennial of the 19th Amendment. This is 100 years of this important piece of legislation, which I do want to say, like, did not grant all women the vote. So when you hear that kind of popular phrase, um, just roll your eyes a little bit and mm -hmm. remind yourself that the 19th Amendment actually prohibited voter discrimination based on sex. So the poll taxes and literacy tests and things that were disenfranchising Black men in the South also applied to people of women of color in the South after the 19th Amendment. And we can go on um, with the Chinese Exclusion Act, etc. So it's a very particular group of people that are enfranchised, enfranchised by the 19th Amendment. And so when we're thinking about that, one thing that I think is really important about this moment and the visual legacy is that Susan B. Anthony is one of the you know leaders who made the suffrage movement imagery iconography what it is today. You know we have so many amazing portraits of her and her colleagues, um, and it's a very skewed vision. So on the one hand we've got this vision of suffrage leaders, and on the other hand it's very skewed. And I think what we're seeing in this centennial moment is things like portraits of Mary Church Terrell being digitized and widely available at the Library of Congress website, right? Her papers are now available for you to transcribe. And we're seeing a light shed on a lot of women suffragists, particularly women of color, that we had lost from the conversation. So I think that's a really exciting part about the centennial and you know, makes it worth kind of like researching. Um, I think the other components are exactly what we were talking about, the legacies of these anti-women's rights images that are still very much part of our conversations today. I'm gonna show you a couple of them. And the ones that we're still kind of like thinking through, I have a lot of great images here, right? So when we're thinking about these pictures, um, I think this one is really, really a great and great example of this, right? We have this idea, you know, women um, can't have it all, right? And this is something that was really established by anti-suffragists long ago, literally using almost the exact same iconography. And you can see how this is kind of still part of our, um, our, our visual conversations even today. And so there is a significant legacy um, of these pro-women's rights and anti-women's rights images. You know, suffragists were also doing this balancing act of, of motherhood and activism too. It's, it's a really challenging um, spot to be in. I'm wondering if even thinking with the visual culture of the women's marches, you know, putting that in conversation with your book, do you imagine from the iconography there that the participants maybe learned the lessons of the suffrage movement in terms of how much it heavily relied on white supremacy? Um, where have we gone? How much have we learned from this in terms of our commemoration of suffrage and also in current activism? Yeah, I think that one really interesting thing about the Women's March iconography um, is when we're looking at, you know, the official images that they went out of their way to produce, they present a particular vision, which everyone promptly ignored, like that wasn't the thing that people 
wanted. And so I think that um, when we're thinking about the ways that these movements are fractured along of various lines, um, we have in the 21st century, a far more individualized kind of response to these images in a way that the suffragists were not interested in. The suffragists wanted it to be like this highly coordinated effort. But what do we have um, as a, you know, what was the most popular kinds of images from that moment? And from a lot of these moments, it's the individual commentary, right? And so I think that that's really a component of these, these, these movements today too. I'll just say before, oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, good. Before we dive into, you know, the general Q&A too, I'm so struck by holding your book and scrolling through my social media feed or turning on the news and this discourse of good protests and bad protests and people who are protesting correctly and, and not protesting correctly and all about being so freighted with race, right, and racism. And your book very brilliantly right from the cover has these images of women protesting in Washington, D.C. And in some ways, I think a lot of our education system has internalized that these are yeah. sort of acceptable protests when they were not in their time. But in some ways, sanitizing that history and violence and the much greater acts of violence that were perpetrated against Black men and women, people in Puerto Rico who tried to fight for their rights, um, we've really done a disservice, I think. And I think public historians are working really hard right now to give us this wider range, I hope, of visuals um, and to move us past this binary of good and bad because it's not useful and it's not giving us the right toolkit to think critically about what's happening and how that violence has intensified. Um, I'm, I'm in no way diminishing what happened to people in 1917 in front of the White House, but it's not a remarkable statement to say that what's happened this week is far more dramatic and far more damaging to human bodies, to people. I agree. And in some ways too, you might think also about, you've written so um, sharply about Sojourner Truth and her mm. emphasis on owning the copyright to her own image. Mm -hmm. And yet when we think about protests happening this week, a lot of which is being shared and reported on platforms like Instagram, there's a lot of complicated questions about, well, who owns the copyright to your image? And how is that mediated and what gets blocked and taken down? So I think there's also the complication too of being censored by um, sources outside of your control as you try to report the truth of what's happened, which of course resonates with a lot of the visual culture history that you present in this book as well with Ida B. Wells and others. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to mention just like the com this complicated moment, you know, I think it's easy for us to forget that in the, you know, 1910s, let's say, suffragists had no idea, suffragists disagreed on how to move forward just, and it was just as like complicated, not as violent as you said, but it was just as complicated and people were just as concerned about what the right move was um, then and they really disagreed about it. And so I think that when we're thinking about, you know, some lessons moving forward, it's like, it's like do your best, right? Like do the thing that you can do. Um, you know, not everyone is going to be able to make a significant donation to an organization. Not everyone is going to be able to protest in the streets. Not, you know, it, it, I think that all these things are really valuable. And when historians look back at the 1910s, no one says, oh, well, the National Women's Party really should have skipped that picket. You know, that, that wasn't a very helpful, or the, the National American Women's Suffrage Association should not have lobbied you know, state legislature so much, or that the National Association of Colored Women should not have educated its members about how to, how to register to vote. Like, all of these things together is where, like, change actually happens. You're making me think of the meme that was circulating this week of what um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. accomplished in his lifetime, and the tagline was that he did this peacefully, and a second version of the meme circulated I think far more widely, which said, and he was murdered, right? You, you know, this, this very explicit connection that it's very easy to lionize and to praise activists when they're not here to continue that discourse because they were, you know, taken out of society by the state. So I think it's, you know, or, or by private actors, but I think it's really complicated. Like people prefer their activists to be quiet. They, they prefer someone who did it a hundred years ago um, because it's, it's not a conversation and conversations are what's hard, but what needs to happen right now. 
Yeah, and we have such particular versions of Martin Luther King and someone like Rosa Parks that are kind of popular in American culture, kind of these more sanitized versions. We kind of lose the kind of rhetoric that he um, advocated, especially in the later years of his life. And um, we, we, you know, there's still kind of a story, though I think it's increasingly being written out of the curriculum, thank goodness, that Rosa Parks, you know, was just tired one day, not that she had been like an active NAACP member and, you know, was, you know, one of the many people who had done this, she was just the one that was the right one to be um, brought forward at the, behind a cause. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, when we lose that part of their personas and kind of look at them as, oh, they were peaceful. No, <laughs> they were they were working really hard um, to, to, to change the system. Well, I think with that, I think we've taken up so much of your time. It's always a dream to get to ask an author every question that comes up as you read their book. So thanks for giving us that opportunity. And now I think we'd love to turn it over to the Q&A questions that our the listeners and viewers have submitted. Yes, thanks guys for a fantastic conversation. Um, I'm gonna just kind of pitch some questions here um, that have coming. You you should be able to see them on your end too, but I'll just kind of um, read read them off for you. So the first has to do um, with the controversy earlier this year where the National Archives decided to alter a photo of the 2017 Women's March. Um, where they blurred signs critical of Trump and signs with references to women's anatomy. Are there, Allison, do you know of any historical parallels to this kind of censorship of um, images? I don't off the top of my head know of other public facing institutions like this that have made that choice. I'm sure that there are examples out there, um, but I think it, it, obviously the National Archives then came out and said it was not the right choice to alter these historical documents, right? We, we trust these, we, we kind of approach images with a certain level of expectation that they're kind of true, or at least a faithful representation of the original image. Um, and that was, um, you know, as they, I think, acknowledged, um, was a, a misuse of the public's trust. Um, the next question, so we, uh, Mary, you talked a little bit about your background. Allison, do you want to talk a little bit about your background? Sure. So this is an image that is hosted on the Library of Congress website. And if you search May Day, uh, which historically has been celebrated as the International Workers Day on May 1st, it really reveals a fascinating visual history of the way that workers staged mass demonstrations on May 1, as opposed to Labor Day, which we tend to think of as the day to honor and think about work. Um, this is one of my all time favorite visuals. And as Allison points out in her book, also like loving this Allison synergy, Allison question, Allison book, Allison answer, um, like at 80% Allison right now. Um, it gives you this very rich culture for understanding parades. And I joked about covering the center, but these labor parades and these labor demonstrations were family affairs. They were community affairs. There was food, there was gathering, there was a connectivity to it. And to Allison's other points about who we lionize or put forward. Um, Rosa Parks was not just tired, there was a movement behind her. And these labor demonstrations were the same. Children were brought, people gathered together. You kind of see um, some different folks here. And it was a day that historically, tens of thousands of people would gather in major cities to protest for better working conditions. All right, thanks for sharing that. Um, someone's asking about the images. So um, the pictures that you, the, all of the images that you work with, Allison. Um, someone who studied women's suffrage in the 19th century, and I know there are a few representations of them in action. Where did you find your pictures specifically? So I don't know how many of those are from the 19th century. I think most of them are from the 20th, right? But um, right. Um, a lot of the kind of outdoor protests that feel really modern to us um, are from the early 20th century. And part of that is even just because of the type of photography that's available in the 19th century. Americans are mostly taking photographs in professional studios. It's really not until the turn of the century where Americans have much greater access to fairly inexpensive cameras so they can actually like take photographs uh, of being outside. Um, and that's also the moment when um, the profession of photojournalist 
comes becomes into play. So, but yeah, it's right around the turn of the century that that really changes. Um, and as far as where I got my images, you know, they're from all kinds of different archives. I really focused on public facing images. So images that were purchased by the public, that the public encountered perhaps in um, shop windows, um, rather than kind of private family photographs that aren't really seeking to create like a public image for that person. I'm wondering, Allison, if you can talk a little bit about what types of images there were in the 19th century. Because again, we're so familiar with the photographs of suffragists. And, you know, when we talk about the, the earlier part of the movement in the 19th century, you know, we're, we're seeing these portraits of Susan B. Anthony and, you know, all these other women. But so can you talk a little bit about kind of what visuals were available during the 19th century part of the movement and, you know, how that kind of played into there? Yes, there were so many images available during the 19th century. You know, earliest on, there are, you know, copper plate engravings, woodblock engravings, which are a little bit cruder, mezzotints, which are far more expensive. Um, by the 1830s, we've got lithographs becoming far more popular, and then, which are largely like black and white kind of shaded. Um, but then chromolithographs um, come into existence, and those make it possible for American families to kind of buy fairly inexpensive, lovely wall art that's really colorful um, by the mid 19th century. And it's right around this time where we have the first photographs. So the first photographs were um, 1838 and 39 with the daguerreotype. And daguerreotypes were printed on, were created on met metal plates using sunlight. You could create one unique, unique image. This is not something that you can like share widely with the public. It's not until 1855 with the invention of the wet plate process where you essentially create a negative. If anyone remembers like film negatives, um, you create a negative on a glass plate and you can create as many positive prints on paper after that. So photographs by the 1860s and we're just when these carte disease become so popular, um, that's the moment where we get so many more photographic portraits. Um, and this is the moment then where, you know, engravers are starting to copy those photographic portraits and make sure that their likenesses are, you know, fairly reliable. It's not until 1890 when the halftone process gets adopted, when you can actually reproduce these photographs in like a newspaper or a magazine. So previously these photographs, if you want a book of photographs in like the 1860s, like post-Civil War, Alexander Gardner, you know, created this beautifully illustrated uh, book of phot photographs of the Civil War. It was all, you know, hand pasted photographs in each time. It's a very expensive book. But by 1890, we have the publication of Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives, which is kind of a perfect, famous example of the ways that people are using photographs, halftone photographs in books to kind of promote reform by exposing the um, horrors of the slums, right, of New York, right? So we have like a pretty significant change. And by the end of the 19th century, the number of Americans who can access, who, who are accessing images um, on a wide scale, you know, very cheaply, constantly is dramatically different than it was in, at the beginning of the century. It's interesting to think about how, you know, they learned to use that over time and kind of adapted to the changing technology. Yeah, and in fact, like illustrated newspapers earlier on, like in the 1840s and 50s, really, when they were becoming popular, actually offered readers like instructions, like how to read these images, what to notice about the pictures, right? And now it's just innate, you know, you scroll through Instagram or something and you just, you, you know, without even thinking about it, what to pay attention to, what something is kind of sim signaling. Um, but it was even more explicit in the 19th century. Um, so the next question, um, did you come across any images of Native American women um, with dealing with the suffrage movement? So there aren't, a, so there are images, portraits of Native women who were active suffragists, but there are no images, you know, kind of propaganda images published by suffrage organizations that are promoting women's votes using a figure of a Native American woman. So 
there are wonderful portraits of Zikala Sa, Marie Louise Botano, Baldwin, you know, we have these portraits of these suffrage activists, um, but they were not used in the same way that like Susan B. Anthony's portrait was. Um, so I think that's important to note. Um, one other thing that's important to note is that Native American voting rights were very much part of this conversation. Um, when we're thinking about who can vote and who can't in the late 19th century, the suffragists, you know, created this propaganda emphasizing that they were being classed, they thought unfairly, with Native Americans who could not vote. And um, there are some really interesting images, one of which is in the American Antiquarian Society's collection called American Woman and Her Political Peers that suggests that these white women should not be associated with kind of a racist stereotype of Native Americans. So Native American women don't play a part in um, kind of suffrage propaganda circulated by the suffragists. I think we have time for just maybe one or two questions. Um, the next one is, would there have been concerns about suffragists being quote unquote doxxed by having their face shown in one of these image, images, the way there are concerns about protesters being identifiable in the current protests? So suffragists were, um, were they were fairly well known, especially when they were arrested. I think one kind of example of the ways that a suffragist identity um, might be interesting is that um, we've got, you know, these representations of um, Susan B. Anthony, for example, um, early on these anti-suffrage images are very much about like non, women that you can't identify, generic women. Um, but after we have Susan B. Anthony kind of promoting the portraits of specific women, then we've got them kind of caricaturing specific women. So we've got them making fun of Susan B. Anthony, for example, in particular. So that's kind of the best example of that that I can offer. And I think, uh, let's see here, the next one. Um, what were some of the concerns of the women who opposed getting the vote? I think, that, yeah, you talked a little bit about this, that, you know, women who um, were, you know, more upper class or um, had more access to, felt like they were getting their voices heard in other ways or had other, um, other ways to kind of access that political representation. Um, but do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I think this is a good question, an important question. There are men and women who advocated for suffrage. There are men and women who oppose suffrage. And people really believed that men represented the family, right? So this is a leftover of this earlier, earlier legal doctrine of coverture in which men, you know, um, are supposed to be the owners of property, um, are supposed to be the ones who handle the money, etc. Um, and so this is the idea that your brother, your father, your sons are voting on your behalf. And so people strongly believe that that was true. Others believed that um, this was, you know, not something that women should do, that women were too moral and pure and shouldn't sully themselves in the corrupt field of politics. Um, and I think that that sounds kind of strange to us today, but people really believed that, that this was their, this was their role in society and they needed to take it seriously and pay attention to their homes and not pay attention to politics. Um, and so I think that you know, and sometimes people even argued that, you know, having women vote would just be more expense, government expense. I mean, there are a host of great um, examples. If you're interested in more, I would highly recommend checking out um, Alice Stone Blackwell's Objections Answered, which both offers her counterpoint to these objections, but lists, the, lists these objections really clearly. Hmm. Um. You know, it's very common, and I actually think there was a little bit in the, the chat happening about this too, um, but, you know, Abigail Adams' famous letter to John about remembering the women, do you know when it became known? Were they using this as well as part of their um, arguments? This was not something that suffragists were using in their campaign, or not something that I have come across, perhaps someone else has. It's not something that I have come across. Um, and I think one thing I would like to say about this fantastic letter that we um, that we're thinking about, um, and it's that John Adams' response is um, really, really 
rough, it's really harsh. It's basically saying if we give you more rights, you know, then our entire society will collapse. It will not just be about women getting rights. You know, um, they talk about Native Americans wanting to go to school, et cetera. And, and he envisions this downfall of society if women win the right to vote. So, you know, Abigail Adams, we see this as like amazing figure. Um, and we often just forget the part where her husband doesn't take her seriously at all. <laughs> This is very uh, interesting once you see it's that and that's that that whole thing about quotes being taken out of context, right? Like it's kind of kind of hard to just grab the one without the others. Um, okay, I think uh, just one more question and then we're going to close up. Um, you show how suffragists crafted their visual images to stave off anti suffrage criticisms of them as too masculine. Did anti suffragists overhaul their public image at any point too, or were they always on the offense while suffragists were on the defense? So that's a great question. So throughout the 19th century, anti-suffragists were very much the dominant party. Um, and in 1895, we actually have the very first anti-suffrage organization founded in Massachusetts. And we are looking at them. They don't actually found their uh, national organization until much later, long after the suffragists had. And by then, they are on the offense because they, they, they've seen that states are increasingly passing women's voting rights or approving women's voting rights. And so that is the moment where they need to emphasize that, okay, even though the suffragists are telling you that they're going to be the more feminine women who are taking care of their families, et cetera, being more patriotic, um, they really emphasize that they are the ones who are the more feminine. Um, there's some great um, illustrations from the Massachusetts Historical Society that, you know, just show these like women in these lovely pink outfits, you know, perfect muffs, kind of show, emphasizing that they are even more this kind of ideal type. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. This is a great conversation. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I can't thank the three of you enough for putting this together and just you know, having an, an all around very interesting, but also I think very um, thoughtful and thought provoking discussion. Uh, I do just want to mention to um, everyone watching that we do have another public program coming up on Monday, June 4th at 3 p.m. Um, it'll be Karen Sanchez Epler talking about Isaiah Thomas's apprenticeship, the labor and value of children's literature. You can find information about that on the website. I also did uh, put a link to that in the chat as well as, um, an email address you can add if you want to get added to a mailing list to kind of get uh, information about up other upcoming programs if you're not already on the list. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll join us again for the next one. All right. Thank thanks you. Thanks all. Interesting.